So my work cut my hours and gave me a day off. So I thought I'd take this time to um, do the second part to that love study that I just posted. Um, that was the more excellent way. Um, this one is about loving how Jesus loved, which is our goal. It's the high calling. Um, in John 17, 23, it says, And the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and you have loved them as you have loved me. And then in John 15, 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. John 13, 34 through 35, it says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, it says, but as touching brotherly love, you have no need that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So I just wanted it to be seen here that as the Father loves Jesus, he loves us. And as God loved us, he wants us to love one another. And this is a teaching of God. This is a commandment of God. So I just wanted to break down some things that are in the word that show us how Jesus loved us so that we can love one another with that same love. Um, first off, and very importantly, love forgives. So in Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So when he says, Love one another as I have loved you, he's telling us, Forgive as I have forgiven you. In Luke 17, 3 through 4, it says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he trespasses against you seven times in a day, then seven times in a day, turn again, and he turns again to you saying, I repent. God says, You shall forgive him. So I find this interesting because Peter, at one point, Obviously, he heard the Lord say this seven times. You know, if he turns to you seven times, you shall forgive him. Because in Matthew 18, 21 through 22, it says, Then came Peter to him, and he said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother if, if he sins against me? He says, Till seven times. And Jesus says to him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So I'm not sure why Peter asked him that unless he was just trying to verify, you know, want to make sure he was on the right page with the Lord, make sure that he forgives his brother seven times if he so-called fell into that, you know, place of life. But I don't know. I'm, I'm not really sure why he asked the Lord that. I just know that he heard the seven times. He heard the Lord say that. And so he was questioning him to verify for whatever the reason in his heart was. I don't know. But I do know that the Lord's answer was telling him, it's unlimited. Um, then if we look at um, Matthew 18, 15 through 20, and this is like after, or I mean before actually, that Peter came to him and asked about seven times, but the Lord said, moreover, if your brother trespasses against you, go to him, tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he shall hear you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglects to hear them, then tell it to the church. If he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man and a publican. So in other words, as a non-believer and a tax collector. That's really not cool. But what I want you to see here is how far... For you to be able to not forgive your brother, this is how far it has to go. This is how serious the Lord is about us forgiving. First, we have to go to them, you know, alone and tell them, hey, you did this. If they repent, you got to forgive them. But if they won't hear you, then you have the right to take one or two more people with you and go to address it again. And still, if you don't repent, 
It has to be brought before the whole church. The whole church. I mean, that's serious. The Lord's really serious about us forgiving one another. Okay. And this is really how serious. I'm going to show you here also in Matthew 18, verse 32 through 35. Then his Lord, after he had called him. This is because this was a parable where um, the guy owed his Lord. And he came to him and he begged him saying, have mercy on me, have patience. And so his Lord did. He forgave him his debt. He loosed him. And then it says after that, um, he went out and someone else owed him. And he would not forgive him his debt. So it was reported to the Lord, and this is what the Lord said. And then after his, then his Lord, after he called to him, he said to him, Oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Should not you have also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth, and he delivered him unto the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts do not forgive everyone his brother their trespasses. This is really serious stuff with the Lord. I mean, love is the most important thing, but forgiveness is a huge part of love. Because we know God forgave us, you know, the Lord. He hung on the cross to forgive our sins. Real serious we should do unto others as we would have them do to us. But anyways, I just wanted to see how serious this forgiveness is. Um, it says in Revelation 1, 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So forgiveness, very important. Uh, John 13, 14 through 15 says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet. So consider, Jesus washed us completely from our sins. This comes from that time when he girded himself with a towel and he was going around and he was um, going to wash, you know, all their feet. And Peter said, Oh, no, Lord, you're, you're never going to wash my feet. And uh, the Lord's like, Well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then he's like, Oh, wash my head. I think he said, my hand, my head, my hands, and my feet. Peter always makes me laugh. Um, but anyways, the Lord told him, he's like, you're clean every whit. You know, every whit. Completely clean. You have no need save to wash your feet. And I know in my heart, is because the Lord has forgiven us our sins, and we are clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we walk in this world. Our feet get dirty. They have to be washed. Anyway, so he says to them in John 13, 14 through 15, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So that right there is very important. When the Lord says to love one another as I have loved you, this is an example he gave us about washing feet. Um, he also said, in John 20, 23, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So, real serious stuff. But I want to take this um, example that he gave us about washing feet and about remitting sins and take it right into intercession. Because that's the next thing that the Lord did for us. He forgave us and we are to forgive one another. Um, but love makes intercession. And I'm going to show you in the Word, um, Romans 8, 33 through 34, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yeah, rather that is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. So if he's making intercession for us, we know we should be making intercession for one another. Then in Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So here we see the Son making intercession for us at the right hand of the Father. We see the Spirit which is the Spirit of God. It is Christ in us, Christ. I mean, God is one. There's one God. Um, anyways, we see the Spirit, we see the Son, and then the Father 
He sent his son for us. That is great intercession. He gave his only begotten son. He interceded for us to save us from our sin. Okay, 2 Timothy 2, 1. It said to us, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So if it is written to us that these things should be done to all men, how much more should we be interceding for the saints? And we see these things in the word where he said, you know, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. I know as I've read the word over the years, I noticed that uh, it would be written in the word a lot, whether it was written of Paul or Peter or whoever, they'd say, we've been giving thanks for you, giving thanks for you, making mention of you, you know, so there, that was a part of their life, intercession for the saints, intercession for those they love. Okay, and then, um, this is about intercession. This is the thing that we have to understand and know deep in our heart, okay? Jesus was our intercessor, okay? And this is what he said to the Father in John 11, 41 through 42. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you hear me always. This was the words of Jesus, okay? He's interceding. The Father always hears him. And then we are told in 1 John 5, 14 through 16, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, according to his will. He hears us. So as the Father heard Jesus, he hears us. If we're asking anything according to his will, and his word is his will. And we know that if he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we desired of him. And now this is interesting. He's talking to us here about asking, right? And that he hears us. And what does he say next? If any man sees his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. But do you see this where he's saying anything we ask, he will do it according to his will. We know his word is his will. So if we're making intercession for our brothers and sisters in Christ, or for anyone for that matter, according to his will, he's going to answer. So when we intercede on behalf of others, we can know he hears and he answers. There is power in prayer. There's power in intercession. Um, and then again, in John 20, 23, he says, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. This is a great authority, a very serious authority. And that is why the Lord is so serious about us forgiving sins. You know, not only forgiving, but if you see them, if you see your brother or sister sin, pray, remove that sin from their lives. You have the power to do that. Love covers a multitude of sin. Jesus covered a multitude of sin. Okay, so this has to do with authority in Matthew 16, 19. He said, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. That means the authority of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I know we've heard all kinds of things, at least I have anyway, and we're going to be like, oh, Satan, I bind you. You know, they're out binding demons and, you know, loosen the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is not bound at all, and you have no authority to bind Satan. Now, the Lord gave us power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. But Satan himself, I mean, you can battle him and have victory, but you have no authority to bind him. That is God's place. He is under God's authority. Um, and the authority that God gave us, yes, but we this, this whole binding and loosing, I want to show you right here. Because when I studied this years ago, I remember finding a scripture that said, um, bind about your neck, I think it was, mercy. And I saw in the word... Binding good things, you know, binding good things to yourself. And and then also I, I realized that um, when Jesus was casting out a demon, he loosed. He, he told one, be thou loosed. 
you know, so I think people kind of get a little backwards, but all the same, I just want to show you this binding and loosing what the Lord is really saying here. Because if you take, okay, he said, whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. Okay, and this is the keys of the kingdom is to bind and loose. But look at Matthew 18, 15 through 20. This is where he takes this binding and loosing. He says, moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Remember, we just read this scripture, but hear this. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglects to hear you, or hear them, tell it to the church. If he neglects to hear the church, let him be unto you as a heathen man and publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Notice he's tying this binding and loosing to sin, to, to forgiving, repenting. Okay, so he goes on to say, again I say to you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done of them, of my Father which is in heaven. So there's a very long process that's supposed to take place in the church for someone's sin to be retained or bound, okay? Because this is what he's telling us here. He's saying, if your brother sins against you, you know, do it this way. And if he doesn't hear you, whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Lucy, you know what I mean? This is binding and loosing is really about removing sin, forgiving sin. I mean, even in our warfare, we're fighting against evil. We're fighting against sin. This is the authority of the kingdom, Okay. Um, this this forgiveness is so important, and intercession is so important. Um, in John 17, if you uh, ever want to see a beautiful prayer of intercession, you can go read the words of Jesus. I love that um, prayer he does in John 17. It's absolutely beautiful. So much treasure is in that chapter. But in short, I'm just going to let you know, he um, interceded for all believers to the end of the age, and his intercession was for safety for unity, for victory over evil, which you can consider that the world, the flesh, the enemy, you know, sin. Um, it was for sanctification and for glorification. So we know those are things that we can intercede for on behalf of our brethren, you know, that they are safe, you know, that there be unity among the church, unity in marriages, and victory over all evil, that we would all overcome the world, that we'd be sanctified and give God glory. Those are just wonderful, you know, things in short. Anyways, okay, so thus far we know that Jesus forgives, Jesus intercedes. Two things we need to do to love as he loved. And then, let me go a little further here. He laid down his life. So it says in 1 John 3, 16 through 18, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us, we ought to also lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso has this world's good and sees his brother has a need and he shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So I know a lot of times it's like God saying, don't just speak about love. Don't just say I love you, but actually do it and do it according to his word. And to do it according to his word, we're going to do it as Jesus did it. And Ephesians 5, 2 says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So if we're going to be followers of God, and walk in love as Christ loved us, then we will give ourselves. That is the sacrifice. Like it says in, I think it's Romans 12, present your bodies, you know, a living sacrifice. That's what we are. We are sacrifices. Christ died for us, and now we are to die for him. But, you know, really what we're doing when we lay down our lives, well, I guess that's more towards the end about loving your enemies, but it is for the salvation of other souls. Um... 
but that's I get to that later. Okay, so, um, but that is a sweet smelling savor to God. So if you want to bless God, laying down your life for the brethren, that's a good thing to do. John ten eleven, he said, "I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep." Um, 2 Corinthians five fourteen through fifteen, for the love of Christ constrains us. That means it compels us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all are dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. Do you see this? In that he died, this is, this is what the church judges, okay? Discern this. He says, if one died for all, then all are dead. So we are dead men, okay? But that we live not henceforth unto ourselves. That's like we're not living according to the old man, we're not living in the world still. We're supposed to lay all that down. Lay down the old man. Lay down your life in the world. Take it up. And really what you're doing is you're letting him live through you. But we should not henceforth live to ourselves, but unto him and to live to him. You know, he said in the Bible, whatsoever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So like when he said, oh, I was sick in a prison. You visited me. I was hungry. You fed me. Whatever we do to people, we're doing to Jesus. So we have to be careful there, but we are called to lay down our life. And that, that is something that love did. He laid down his life for us, so we should lay down our lives for one another. In whatever way that may appear at whatever time. You know, like the one scripture said, your brother has a need and you shut up your bowels of compassion. How is the love of God in you? Because part of laying down our life is that nothing we have is our own. That's how it was in the beginning of the church. They they nothing they considered nothing they had of their own. They had all things in common. Because they laid down their life for the Lord, which was shown in them laying down their life for one another. He who had much had nothing over, he who had little had no lack. There was equality, and that is God's will for the church. Okay, and then this other beautiful thing that uh Jesus did that we should also do. Okay, it is very clear in the scriptures. He loved his people to the end. And I just want to take a look at that in the scripture. John 13, 1 says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. There was no spot where Jesus didn't love them while he walked this earth. But let us continue on from there, because it's even better. John 17, 20, in that prayer of intercession I was telling you about, he said, Neither pray I for these alone, because he was praying for the saints at that time. He said, But I pray also for them, also, which shall believe on me through their word. And there, that takes us right up to the saints of today, okay? So his, he loved them to the end. So he's taken from there through his walk here, and then he prayed also for us right to this point today. And he's praying for those who will also believe on him through their word. Then in Matthew 28, 20, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And this, he spoke to the disciples standing there face to face. But guess what? We are not to the end of the world yet. So I know that the Lord is with us to the end of this age. And that's, that's awesome. His love never fails. There's never no spot where it stops. And I pray that, that that's how it would be among the saints. Because there should be no, nothing should separate us from our love of one another. Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetous, covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we should not leave or forsake our brethren. There's only certain reasons in the word why you part fellowship, and it should only be for those reasons. Um, but, you know, the Lord does prefer mercy. Romans 8, 35 through 39, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? 
As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No. I love that. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. And let's throw in there unforgiveness, offense. It shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There should be nothing allowed to remain in our hearts that should separate us from the love of one another. Um, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, Love endures all things and it never fails. That is why his love endures to the end. And so should ours. Because it endures all things. I mean, we can take... We should be able to take sin. I mean, think about how many times we've sinned against the Lord, how many things, how many mistakes we've made, bad decisions. You know, just if you think about your own sin, your own faults, your own mistakes, you should be able to have mercy, you know, on others, knowing what God has forgiven of you. And if you have spent any time at all walking with the Lord, you know his mercy and his love more and more. And, and you should be able to, as you freely receive, freely give that. And especially as you've walked with the Lord more and more, you do realize you can't do anything of yourself. So therefore, the growth and changing of all of our brothers and sisters is in God's hands. We have no power over how long that's going to take. But we do have the responsibility to love them through that process and pray for them and forgive them. Love them to the end, to the utmost. Okay, so, so far we had we forgive, we intercede, we lay down our lives. This is how we love as Jesus loved. And then there's this part. And a lot of people will go crazy with this part. It might be their favorite part, but I would say if it's their favorite part, their hearts probably aren't right. But then on the other hand, it is very important. And there is a slack. Of this in the church there's far too much compromise but that is what Jesus said revelations 319 as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent okay when it says as many as I love I rebuke and chasten that sounds real harsh you know that old English but what it means is I correct and instruct so we have an obligation to correct and instruct our brothers and sisters. Um, it does say he gave apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists for the perfecting of the saints. Um, you know, like we have no need that any man teach us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. But yet, God uses his body to instruct, also sometimes to rebuke. But in essence, we're just a vessel. You know, it's just the word of God and the Holy Spirit that is to be correcting people. But we should not let those things slide. Like I said, if we see our brother sin a sin, not in death, pray that the Lord would forgive him. But there's times we have to speak correction and rebuke for the safety of their souls, for the safety of the whole body of Christ. So we can't just set that aside and go, oh, not, not my business. I'm not my brother's keeper. But we are. God meant us to be. He said, love one another as I've loved you. That wasn't his mentality. Oh, not my business, not my problem. No, we have to, we are a brother's keeper in love. Um, Hebrews twelve six says, "For whom the Lord loves, He chastens, and He scourges every son who He receives." Second Timothy four two, we are told, "Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine." That means with patience and endurance. You see that loved him to the end. Okay. Luke 17, 3 through 4, take heed to yourselves. Now, this is when the word says, take heed to yourselves. This is something we should listen. He says, if your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. So we cannot let sin remain. Sin and unforgiveness is things that separate us from God. Those things have to be dealt with. They really have to be dealt with. Okay. Uh, Galatians 6, 1-2 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, 
Okay, now here, this is telling us the how to go about this correction thing. Because we don't want to be rude. Like, I know, I've been told over and over. I, I, people get mad at me. I'm just blunt. I just get to the point. And I just figure, if somebody loves the Lord and they believe the word, then they're just going to hear the truth and be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I do. I, I come across blunt, I guess. I get unfriended sometimes. I don't, it's, my, it's not in my heart to be um, mean or rude, you know, because pride is a horrible, horrible thing. Pride comes before destruction, nothing to be played with. But on that note, we have to love the Lord more than, we have to fear the Lord more than we fear men. So we shouldn't be afraid to tell someone the truth. You know, there's eternal I can't even think of the word. Consequences. There's eternal consequences. So if you love someone, you have to tell them the truth. You know? Anyway, okay, but here's how we're supposed to do it. And this is something I'm trying to learn to do better, not to offend people, you know? But the Lord offended people. Uh, it says right in the word. The disciples were like, Lord, did you not know that the, what you said to them offended them? I mean, sometimes the truth offends people. But maybe it's just a seed that later on will be brought to mind and there will be some, you know, something good there. But anyways, okay, so if a man's overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Okay, so pride. If you want to go jump in and get deceived, or if you want to fall... Just have pride. It'll get you there real quick. So that's why he's telling us, in a spirit of meekness, you know, we must, and we're, we're seeking restoration, okay? We're not seeking to hurt someone's feelings or exalt ourselves above them. We're, we're seeking to restore them to safety, to truth, and to God's love, you know, safety. So, must be done in the spirit of meekness, and we have to consider ourselves, you know, lest we be tempted also, because we don't, pride is a bad thing. And then we are told, bear ye one another's burdens. That means weight, that burden's like a heavy load. You know, bear one another's loads. We're all going to have loads, we are, we're all going to go through temptations and trials, because it's part of our perfecting. But, you know, let us encourage one another, bear one another's burdens. Um, and so, fulfill the law of Christ. You know, what is the law of Christ? Love one another. How can we say we love one another if we don't bear one another's burdens? Okay, 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, the servant of the Lord must not strive. To me, that saying, don't be about strife, don't be arguing, okay? But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, Instructing those that oppose themselves. So you see, whenever we get in error, if we're in sin or we're even in doctrinal error, we're opposing ourselves because we're being contrary to God. You know, the enemy is, is supposed to be the opposer of, of the righteous, the opposer of God, not us. Not us. We're not supposed to oppose our own selves, let alone God. Okay, but this is the key here. That's what I was saying about nobody... Nobody has the ability to grow themselves or change themselves. Only God does. So if we think we're going to tell somebody something and they're just going to hear it by our own power, it ain't happening. Only the Holy Spirit can bring that about. And as it says here, so we instruct these people, not striving, gentle, patient, and meekness. We instruct them, if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. God has to allow this, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And I'm telling you, it's pride. If we are taken captive in the snare of the devil, it is pride. Oh, and sin. Sin's an open door too, of course. But we just got to stay away from that pride. But, uh, okay, so Jesus said in Matthew 11, 29 through 30, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. See, there's that weight bearing those burdens. He says, and I will give you rest. That should be our heart towards our brethren. You know, rest. We all need rest. The Lord gives his beloved rest. So we should help give our brethren rest. 
He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And that should be our heart. You know, the word tells us to esteem others better than ourselves. So, I mean, he's saying here he's meek and lowly in heart. And who did he esteem? He esteemed us. He laid down his life that we might take ours up. Not in the world, but in his kingdom for all eternity. So how much more should we lay down our lives? Um, anyway, so when he says, I am meek and lowly in heart, he says, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So when we think about our brethren, instead of being judgmental, condemning, or even offended or disappointed, you know, let us look at what the Lord's done for us and the things that we have failed in. It's not so hard, you know, to esteem others. I don't have a problem esteeming others better than myself because I know who I've been, where I've been, even why I've been some things. And now it's easy for me to esteem others better than myself. And if we always look at Jesus, if we compare ourselves to him, it keeps us low because he's perfect. Okay, so on that note, these are the things that we can do to love our brethren. Okay, but let's go just a little bit further than that. Okay, so Jesus tells us in James 2.8, If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love, love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Okay. So this isn't even talking about loving the brethren, which is an extreme love we should have. This is talking about our neighbors. Just, you're walking down the street, that's your neighbor. Anyone we come into contact with, he's telling us, love your neighbor as you love yourself, okay? But the respect to persons, okay, God, it was written in the word of God, God does not have respect to persons, it is sin. And there is a scripture I recall right off the top of my head right now, uh, someone well-dressed, rich, comes in your congregation, you tell them, oh, come up here and sit in the front. And then another guy, homeless beggar, whatever, comes in, you tell them, oh, have a seat back there, you know, way back there. This is respect to persons. We can't love black people more than white people or Chinese more than Russian. We can't love the rich and not the poor. We can't love the poor and hate the rich. Works both ways. No respect of persons. You cannot love Jewish people and hate Muslim people. Do you understand? No respect of persons. Don't look at people by how they're dressed, what they have, the color of their skin, how they talk, you know, education. Look at that person as a soul that Jesus died for. That's how we're to look at people. That's how he sees people precious souls that he created and he died for them and that's how you know he says love others as you love yourself well he died for me so i try to remember he died for everybody it's very important to show god's love because it's the goodness of god that leads people to repentance and we want souls to be saved i don't want to see people go to hell okay so Romans 13, 10, it says, Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay, so let's move on from just our neighbors. We're moving on here. It's going to get a little hotter. Love your enemies. Matthew 5, 44 through 48, the Lord said, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them which curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Consider that. If we love those who love us, Sometimes I think people have a hard time loving people in the church, but we're called to love our enemies. But the Lord's saying here, if you love those who love you, which most likely you're going to get love, more love from the church. Well, 
than the world. Although sometimes I wonder, but anyway, scratch that from this. Okay, so if you love them, what, who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the publicans the same. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Even the publicans do so. Be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So here, this is the above and beyond. <laughs> My pastor had this thing I heard when I first started going to their fellowship. He said something about us go a stone's throw further. And I remember when I was looking at that, uh, the Greek for the more excellent way, you know, love is the more excellent way. It said like uh, a casting further. And this reminds me of that, a stone's throw further. Because loving your neighbor, loving your brethren, but look at this, loving your enemies. And he tells you, what reward is there for loving those who love you, you know? What reward is there for being nice to those who are nice to you? But this, this, loving your enemies, there's reward for this. This is where your reward comes in. So, anyway, I just, and, and the whole reason we love our enemies is the same reason that Christ loved us. He said, while you were yet enemies, he died for you so that he could reconcile you to God. This is why we love our enemies. It's for the possibility that they could be saved. You know, they could come to salvation. The goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. And the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So it really isn't a whole lot for us to lay down our life here. We have eternal life. We have awesome things, you know, in the age to come. This here is, is really nothing. This here is full of sin and sickness and evil. I mean, I don't want my life here. I want my life in that time to come. So, you know, Lord, take our lives. Let us be living sacrifices so that more souls can be saved and more people can go with us. We don't want to leave anyone behind, even though there will be a lot of people that will be left behind. But, you know, God help us. God save them. Okay, so this is the big question here. These things, like in the last teaching I did on the more excellent way, it is not possible to love your neighbor, to love the brethren, to love your enemies as Jesus loved. It is not possible to love as Jesus loved of your own self. This is something that has to be put in you by God and then be grown by God. And I'm going to show you that in the word because um, this is the only way it's possible to love as Jesus loved. 1 John 4, 8, he that loves not knows not God for God is love so it tells you right there to be able to love you must first know God that is the beginning okay first John 4 16 says we have known and believed the love that God has to us God is love he that dwells in love dwells in God notice the word dwells herein oh and God dwells in him Herein is our love made perfect. So if you want your love to be perfected, you have to dwell in God. You know, you first, you know him, you believe, and then you dwell and your love will be perfected. And that is so that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is love, so are we in this world. So first, if you want to be able to love as Jesus, first, you have to know his love, know him. You have to believe it, receive it. And then you have to keep walking with him, dwell in him. You can't just forget about it, walk away and expect it's going to happen. Because he said, and this is the end of this, he said in John 15, and this is the key of all things in the kingdom of God, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except you abide in the vine, Jesus is the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So, oh, that we would all keep our minds stayed on this, to love as Jesus loved. You know, we're always praying for people to get saved, praying for revival. But this is it right here to know his love, to walk with him, let it abound. This is the high calling. 
to have Christ formed in us, to, to love as he loved, to walk as he walked, to speak the truth in love. Anyways, I hope that the study will help somebody out there just to see exactly how, you know, we love, how we keep God's commandment. And I know there's so much more in the word of God than just this, but this is like the, the overview of it. I'm sure there's more details you could seek out with the Lord. Anyways, uh, have a blessed day.